מרחבא על ג'מיה, שלום לכולם, it's very good to be here, I'm very thankful for uh, Middle East Monitor for staging this event. Uh, there's always a danger of course that a long and protracted conflict and suffering as happened to our people uh, will be forgotten in the world stage where new events, uh, new dramas are happening and that's actually been the fate in the last few years. And uh, to keep this on the agenda and to keep the um, uh, suffering of the Palestinians and just suffering of the Palestinians on the agenda is uh, very important and I thank you for inviting me and for keeping it alive. Now, um, we have a bit of uh, technology here uh, and I prepared uh, hopefully uh, a presentation that will help us fathom through the processes. Uh, first of all, my main uh, argument here is that we are entering a new stage in Israel-Palestine. And we are entering a new stage in Israel-Palestine which is not unlike other settler colonial projects that have not been determined. And I think that's very important. It's unlike, uh, in that respect, the US or Australia that overwhelmed and maybe genocided the native people. Israel-Palestine, we have a settler colonial project which is ongoing, but the Palestinians have not been eliminated and they are resisting uh, uh, which uh, is a very major factor where maybe we should uh, consider in more depth. And, and therefore, uh, we're entering a new stage. Um, and this is uh, very much reflected in two statements here that uh, Netanyahu, uh, the eternal uh, Prime Minister of Israel, has uh, uh, just recently um, issued. One is just three years ago, um, following the uh, UN uh, Assembly, that uh, we are committed to the Bar Ilan speech in 2009, the first time he uh, made this commitment, for the solution of the conflict based on two states for two peoples. Just uh, a few weeks ago, in fact just two days before the elections, he dropped this bombshell. Uh, we will now go to the next phase to extend Israel's sovereignty. I do not distinguish between settlement blocks and isolated settlements. All settlements are Israeli. That is in response to uh, a TV interview that says to him, you are not doing anything of the right-wing agenda. Why don't you annex parts of the West Bank or the West Bank? And his response, yes, we're going to start annexing. So this, uh, in a way, is a new geopolitical stage. Um, and uh, while I echo some of the Joseph Massad idea that there is a continuation, and you'll see my lecture, there is a historical continuation of over 100 years, still we have, through struggles, uh, have had different stages to it and, and now we're entering a new stage and the nation state law it's one of the pinnacles, one of the foundations of a new constitutional stage in Israel-Palestine um, so some of my points, uh, it's an unresolved settler colonial conflict they're not many like this in some uh, conflicts the settler colonial project is defeated say like in South Africa or almost defeated uh, in some, uh, the whites or the European settlers actually overwhelm the, the locals, but in some others, like Israel-Palestine, the jury is still out. Of course, the Jews are very dominant. Uh, this is their project, but uh, in uh, Bolivia, uh, perhaps in uh, New Zealand, uh, perhaps in Mexico, or perhaps in other places, the indigenous people and the native people have a resistance, a continuing resistance, and actually uh, uh, the struggle continuing on a, on a structural level. Um, the structural forces that are here are, uh, of course, it's mentioned quite a bit before, colonialism, but also nationalism and also capitalism. We're not start an academic lecture now on all the structural forces, but they interact to, to uh, present, and that's my major argument, uh, a process of deepening ap apartheid. And this is not declared. This is something that is actually in between the lines, but I think... Our task as intellectuals and, and mobilized people is to change the discourse and not talk about democracy and occupation, but to talk about what's actually happening on the ground, which is the formation of an apartheid regime step by step. And this, of course, to mention to everybody, it's illegal, it's, it's, a, it's a crime, it's a war crime, it's a crime against humanity to have an apartheid regime. There's a world convention against apartheid from 1978, and I think that's something that can be mobilized more than the occupation, because the occupation is not illegal under international law. Occupation, of course, nobody imagined that occupation will last 51, 52 years as it is now, but it's not illegal as such, whereas apartheid is a crime against humanity, and I think it's something that can be mobilized 
And of course, as a Jew, it's also very, very upsetting for a Jew to be live in, in an apartheid uh, regime. So there's a lot of Jewish people that would actually could join this campaign. And I wrote a few articles before the last election that the next task for the next uh, decades, perhaps, is to form a front against apartheid that will be Jewish, Palestinian, international. And, and I think this is what uh, part of, of the lecture today. Um, another point that I want to make, and already Suhad Bishara made that quite clearly, I want to join that, that uh, the present absentees of the nation state law are not just the Palestinians in Israel. Of course they are, and it's important that they are actually shoved to a lower stage status uh, in the Israeli state, but very much also the Palestinians in the territory, for the reason that I'll elaborate. Uh, but in the debate in Israel itself, they hardly ever mentioned the issue of equality, there is no equality in this law, which wasn't mentioned in the first uh, session. It's important to say it's a, it's a formation, it's a law of all laws that doesn't mention equality, which is a, a gr grave injury to the Palestinian uh, citizens of Israel. But as I'll show uh, later, the Palesti all Palestinians basically are affected by this law, and the real present absentees that are not even mentioned in the debate are Palestinians in the territories. And I want to uh, finish with a few minutes, if we have time, to talk about the new peace, peace movement that I'm one of the founders of, uh, that is called uh, Land for All, um, El Arl al Jamia, and it's uh, Eretz Lekulam. And we talk about two states and one homeland in a new understanding that we think can decolonize uh, Israel Palestine and uh, start a movement towards con reconciliation. Um, these are the two recent books that I did. You see, uh, as academics, we have to have a little bit of a commercial break always. So uh, it came out uh, this year, Emptied Lands, with uh, Sandy Kadar and Ahmad Amara. Too. It's a legal geography of the Bedouins, and I think that's uh, an important neglected part of the, of the conflict that is now actually uh, coming to the surface. And a new uh, special issue of uh, settler colonial studies is coming in the next month. It's about uh, settler colonialism in the Judaity and the city. Um, and we'll continue on. So if you like to complete Joseph Massad's uh, uh, historical kind of uh, ideology development of thoughts, I would put it also in maps and look at the process which is undeniable of the Judaization of uh, Israel-Palestine. So in 1917, we have 67 Jewish settlements. It's a small Jewish community comprising something like 8% of the population, holding on to 2% of the land. Uh, in 1947, we already have 332 Jewish settlements. The population of Jews is a third, and uh, they're holding 8% of the land. Then, of course, after the Nakba, um, 1967, there are 764 Jewish settlements. Uh, the uh, state has confiscated most of the land of the Palestinians that remained in Israel, uh, holding now 93% of the land. Then after 67, uh, Jews begin to settle in the West Bank and Gaza. And in 1993, on the eve of the Oslo Accord, we have 911 Jewish settlements uh, and uh, uh, penetrating deep into what remained uh, Palestinian territories. And just this year, we have 1,178 Jewish settlements. And the Jewish control of the land between the Jordan and the sea is now 85%. I'll uh, look at it. And the population is about 50-50%. Uh, so you see how important the geographical process here. And of course, I think that's the heart of the matter. And um, Masad rightly talked about demography, but demography cannot be decoupled from geography. That is, uh, 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 the Jewish majority will be maintained, and Israel will only annex probably areas that has a Jewish majority. Therefore, they will always uh, uh, maneuver around the question of, of demography, and we can talk about that in, in, in a minute. But that is a very, very powerful uh, settler colonial process that, of course, uh, laws and norms, violence, uh, are arranged around this kind of imperative of settling the, the, the land. And I think the nation state law has to be taken in that context. Uh, of course, Palestinian uh, geography, too has to be uh, studied. So in 1947, we have 910 Palestinian localities, including 11 uh, cities. And in 1949, uh, after the Nakba, we have uh, about 450 Palestinian villages being demolished. 
uh, Palestinians uh, uh, are uh, removed uh, from uh, much um, of the land that was supposed to be a Jewish state and actually marked uh, where Palestinians were uh, cleansed from. And also Jews, says to be in very small numbers, but still Jews were also were driven out of East Jerusalem and some other settlements into the Jewish areas. But of course, this is a, a, a structural process. And Palestinian geography has remained more or less since 1949 frozen. The population has grown in the same localities. Very, very few localities were built, mainly for Bedouins that the state wanted to concentrate. And I think this is very much uh, telling the story. Uh, so when we get to today, situation on the left, you see the political geography of Israel-Palestine and uh, the uh, dark green uh, enclaves are the Palestinians in the West Bank uh, and Gaza. The light green are the, where the Palestinians uh, are in Israel proper. And uh, the white area is land. And I've done a lot of research on this. And also in the, when I was the head of B'Tselem, the uh, human rights organization, we actually did a series of publications about how land has been Judaized. Uh, uh, land is now 85% in Jewish hands, Jewish stroke Israeli hands, uh, and only 15% uh, in Palestinian. And look at the demography on the right, you'll see that the two populations are more or less equal. So this is the context in which uh, the new stage is actually happening. And the new stage is happening because uh, that kind of uh, geography has to be enshrined in law. It has to be enshrined in regulation. It cannot continue to be temporary or by theft or by uh, uh, you know, turning a blind eye as happened until uh, the recent time. Um, what all else uh, needs to be remembered here in this kind of different phases uh, that um, the history of Jews needs to be also mentioned here in, in the first stage. The Jews mostly are refugees. The Holocaust is still hanging on as a very, very important injury and drive of Jewish uh, collective uh, identity. And I think that to understand Zionism, you have to understand that Jews arrived into their promised homelands, so supposedly from the Bible, as people that are driven out of Europe and then driven out of the Arab world as well. Um, and then the, the stages that I already uh, mentioned are happening. There's the ethnic cleansing of the Nakba years, independence Nakba years. There's internal colonization, external colonization. Between 93 and 2015, we have this uh, oppressive consolidation that is Israel is strengthening it, its uh, uh, Jewish colonization inside and outside uh, of the Green Line, but without major legal uh, changes. And the rupture, the tension between the actual situation on the ground and the legal construct of a democratic and Jewish state, or Jewish and democratic state, are too far to bear. And this is why we see the last stage. And the last stage is following the 2015 victory of the Netanyahu previous elections. And the, uh, of course, in politics, uh, forces in politics always push for change for advancing their, their agenda, and they're actually successful. And from 2015, we see a major change in various, of course, there are roots of this change earlier on, but from the 2015, it's institutional, it's legal, it's geographical, and, and then the nation state law. And there are um, a whole lot, host of changes, um, and I summarize it in five points here. First of all, we have more and more uh, imposition of Israelis' laws also in the West Bank. These are existing laws. This is not new legislation, but new regulation that uh, extend them to the um, West Bank. You have direct legislation on the territories. For the first time, you have uh, legislation about higher education. You have legislation about uh, land, what uh, Suhad said, uh, the validation law. You have, for the first time, direct Knesset legislation on the territories. You have um, the blaring of the Green Line in many uh, other regulations. And, and, and you have uh, uh, new military orders that uh, further the, and deepen the attempt to concentrate the Palestinians in their enclaves. But it also continues inside the, the Green Line. And a major area of that is uh, Beersheba, where I live. So you see Beersheba is surrounded by what is cons considered to be uh, unrecognized or illegal Bedouin localities. Uh, most of these people live on their ancestors' land. 
uh, they haven't actually moved. These are the people that survived 1948 evictions. Uh, and uh, through um, legal manipulation, they've been declared trespassers on their own land. So the state doesn't extend any services. There's now about 125 to 130,000 people that are in this situation. And in the last election campaign, uh, the government uh, promised that after the election, they will remove 125,000 Bedouins, resettle them in modern uh, towns, of course, all for their benefit, so they can actually enjoy modern life in a, in a, in a planned town. And of course, that would mean uh, concentrating them and, and opening the, uh, the land for more Jewish settlements. So this is inside the green line. Umar Khiran was a very famous case that actually uh, Suhad Bishara also worked on it, and um, uh, a whole uh, locality that has been evicted to make room to a uh, Jewish uh, suburb there. And in the last years, a lot of my work uh, for human rights in the South, they, we broke a very negative record, 2,550 house demolitions in the Beersheba region. Just to put it in comparison, in the West Bank, in the whole West Bank, and I'm still keeping these records because of B'Tselem, there are 380 demolitions. Not that that's little, that's huge too. But think about how much more of an attack inside Israel there is uh, a, on, on the Bedouins. So um, Jerusalem too, um, these kind of this kind of logics continue the colonial logic. But there is another interesting issue here, that Israel has another side. Israel has a liberal side. If you go to Tel Aviv, if you go to Haifa, you have a global, cosmopolitan, pluralistic uh, face of Israel. You have uh, a very advanced on gay rights. You have the Eurovision in a couple of weeks in Israel. Uh, you have women's rights, very impressive campaigns for women's rights. Uh, uh, so there's another face to Israel, which I think we have to look at it as clash of logics, right? It's not just the colonial logic. There's others, and the colonial logic is stronger at the moment, but I think we have to consider this very also uh, uh, other traditions and other political agendas that are happening and uh, something to work with. Um, there's also Palestinians in Israel that the situation has improved in recent years. There's a Palestinian middle class. It hasn't happened before. And, and of course, Haifa is one of the areas. Nazareth, the whole central Galilee, is, there is an, a the metropolitan area, basically, with, with uh, uh, development and rising living standards. And I think that has to be taken into account. And you'll see how it flows into my analysis of the apartheid regime. Um, one other issue is the legal side. Uh, Suhad Bishara already covered that, but I'd like to mention in 2015, um, there was a spate of, of, of decision, court decisions that haven't happened before. And this is why it's very important that we are in a, in, a, in a new stage. And we call it the Black Spring. There were four decisions, one after the other, Al-Ukbi, Susia, Dirat al and Khan al and later on Umar Khiran too. Uh, and in 2017, a very uh, important decision, Amona. In the decision to evict the Jewish settlers, Actually, the High Court says that it is legal to expropriate land for settlers because settlers are considered local population. This is the first time. And actually, sadly, it was a Palestinian judge that said that, Salim Dubran. So uh, uh, these are a spate of legislation. All of them deny uh, Palestinian land rights, uh, residency rights. Uh, uh, and, and this is the High Court that was in the past, as Suhad Bishar rightly uh, said, a place where you can gain and you can protect some rights. I had some important decisions in the past, uh, like Adan, like the Mizrahi Keshet uh, Rainbow, like the uh, uh, several other decisions against uh, torture and against house demolitions. All that seems to now have dissipated and sort of preparing the ground, if you like, for the nation state law. Um, how much more time do I have? Uh, you have roughly five minutes. Five minutes, okay, so I'll rush through this. A new legal order. Um, okay, so we get to the basic law nation state. Much of it has already been said, but I'll still draw and stress the importance of the, uh, these uh, four articles. Article 1, for the first time, as it was said, it declares that the land of Israel between the Jordan and the sea, etc., etc., so it changes the geography. But it does that in a sophisticated way. If you read it, it says that in that area there is a state of Israel. And the law only applies to the state of Israel. 
So it's a sophisticated, sophisticated way to uh, oppose any kind of, uh, uh, of direct call of apartheid. But I want to stress that within that sophistication, the reality on the ground, actually, it is uh, full uh, Israeli legislation in between the Jordan and the sea. Um, Article 3 on Jerusalem, it wasn't mentioned here before, but it's very important, it enshrines the united Jerusalem as the capital of Israel and only the capital of Israel that actually already annuls the possibility of a Palestinian state that is, uh, Jerusalem should be its capital, or it's a very, very, very difficult legal process then to undo that because, as already been said, it's the law of all laws. Article 7 wasn't mentioned before, and for me it's the most important. Of course, as a geographer and a planner, but this is the first time in Israel's history that this is actual law, and not just law, but a basic law, saying that the project of the state is to uh, promote and fund and uh, establish uh, Jewish settlements. Uh, before that, it was always policies of certain arms of government, so the Jewish agency, or the Jewish National Fund, or the kibbutz movement, or the settler movements. Now it's actually crowned as the major national uh, project of Israel. And of course, this already has been uh, fought in court, already been used uh, uh, when we try to protect Palestinian and Bedouin rights. It's already been used. That what do you say? This is the basic law to support Jewish uh, settlement, and that's why it's the right to have new Jewish settlements uh, when there is a contested land. So this is another major uh, change. And of course, 80% of the Jewish settlement in the last 50 years has been in the West Bank and Gaza, but in the West Bank. So it's, it's very important to know that the reality on the ground, that this Clause 7 is all about the territories. And Article 11 also is very important because it's got legal fortification. This law can be rescinded only by another basic law. Uh, and uh, this is almost mission impossible. Uh, so the upshot is legal regime from Jordan to the sea. And I want to elaborate a little bit about what type of citizenships now we are created with the aid of this law and all the other. So we basically have three or four tiers of citizenships. And Suad Bishara talked earlier her opposition to second class citizenship, but I can see three classes of citizenships in very sort of broad uh, strokes of a brush. Uh, there is the Jewish citizenship, of course, it's got stratification within it as well, but that's for another lecture that in uh, the prototype of apartheid uh, is the white population. And of course, I would say that apartheid, like democracy, like theocracy, like ethnocracy, is a prototype. It has many sub-examples. Uh, and um, Asad Ranim, that will speak soon, and I, we, 20 years ago, we talked about Israel is not a democracy, but an ethnocracy. And we projected there is a possibility uh, of ethnocracies if they don't resolve the conflict to actually deteriorate to apartheid. And this is actually what's happening. Ethnocracy is gradually turning to apartheid. But then there are Palestinians, uh, Palestinian Arabs in Israel that have citizenship and have a lower status than the Jews, but uh, they have a higher status than other Palestinians. So they create, if you like, a situation akin to the Khaleds in South Africa that were in between the blacks and the whites. And we have the Palestinians in the territories where, it, again, inverted comma, black, uh, you know, disenfranchised from political right, uh, have a claim to self-determination is unfulfilled. There's a fourth category of foreigners that are called gray citizenship uh, that is not negligible anymore, it's probably three to 400,000 people, but outside this analysis at the moment, although it does indicate Israel uh, treatment of, for example, of the African asylum seekers, uh, or the East Europeans that come to Israel, or the Philippines, is actually indicative of this kind of regime. So we're having, this is now becoming from de facto to de jure. You actually can find legislation and regulation that actually stratifies this citizenship, uh, uh, and in, in, it, it's a combination of uh, history uh, and geography, right? Because Palestinians are divided between the different geographies, and you can actually subdivide also to to Al-Quds Palestinian, and Zrazen Palestinian, and West Bank Palestinian, etc. But the Jews attempt to have unified, smooth geography. And that is exactly the, the difference between uh, uh, geography and rights. And I think this is where uh, the nation state law actually is now enshrining more and more um, in writing. And it's a very dangerous stage. It's a very negative stage. And um, the geography is not dissimilar to uh, what was South Africa until 1994. 
Uh, if you see the Bantustans that uh, were actually the areas where blacks were supposed to have the self-determination, and the rest of the area, 87% actually, was supposed to be in white control. In Israel-Palestine, as I calculated, it's 85%. It's not all that different to what... And, of course, you have to take the, the map of the Negev uh, further down, and uh, you'll see uh, some... It's not identical. The history of Israel, uh, Palestine, and South Africa are uh, not identical, but nonetheless, it's very similar in terms of regime. It emerged into regime. But one big difference between South Africa and Israel-Palestine is the, are the rights of the, uh, of the uh, colonized people. Now, Palestine, and that's important, have the right to a state. And that's the highest right in international law and in international norms. It's been, uh, of course, uh, badly damaged by, by policies, but I think that's uh, important to think about when we think about how to resist and how to decolonize. So it's got the old colonial order, if you like, and the new kind of uh, uh, arrangements uh, 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 that uh, Israel is trying to impose. Um, and I don't have to convince you, as some other people were already warning about some you know, very mainstream stream people like John Kerry warning Israel to uh, become an a apartheid state. Uh, Ehud Olmert, the Israeli prime minister, when he lost power, he said that Israel will very, very uh, soon become an apartheid state. And um, I want to spend two minutes about how we think in our movement um, Eretz Lekulam, a land for all, Bilal of Jamia, that uh, we think about uh, moving forward. And it's a movement that started five years ago. We have uh, a few hundred um, members from Palestine, a few hundred from Israel, probably about a thousand altogether. You're all invited to look at our internet site and Facebook. But we think about... Um, these are just... Uh, we appeared in the Euro European Union Assembly not long ago... Um, the main idea here is to have two states in one open land. The main idea is to have a confederation. That is, the Palestinians will have a state with full sovereignty. The Israelis, Israelis which are Jews and Palestinians, will have self-determination in the territory. The Green Line will not be modified. And um, the Jerusalem will be a region like Brussels, that is the capital of Palestine and Israel, and a city of two peoples. And uh, a key uh, idea will be there will be freedom of movement. That uh, is, of course, a major change for Israel-Palestine, but nonetheless, it allows to have, with minimum disruption, uh, a possibility of, of uh, moving from a colonial order to one of more of reconciliation and equality between the two people, and sharing the homeland, which is uh, a, a, the attachment to the homeland by the uh, Jews and by the Palestinians is almost exactly the same piece of land, and that has to be uh, that has to be taken into account when we think about the future. Um, just recently, last week, we did um, on the Green Line near Hussam in the West Bank an event that hundreds of people came, mostly Palestinians, but also some Israelis. Of course, the interest among Palestinians is higher, uh, but I think it's a way to the future. And let's end up with this. Uh, Suggest the photograph, you know, it could be the wall closing, which has been for a long time, uh, uh, but optimism might read it that it could be the beginning of the dismantling of the wall, and let's uh, keep these two options open, and thank you very much.